Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, also bettingangle.us. It is May the 5th, 2024. Let's talk about Canelo's victory over Jaime Munguia. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, let me just say, <clears throat> Canelo is in a unique position right here. Right now, let me just say this. Um, you know I feel life's unfair. I'm not PC. Whenever you're there and you're by, you know, waters, um, just understand the waters are always shark infested. Right? You have a group, let's say 20%, they're with you rain or shine, <clears throat> right? They are with you. They have been down from day one. But then you have another group who's only with you as long as you are popular, right? The world has choppy waters. I believe Wilt Chamberlain put it best. This is one of the quotes I, you know, live my life by. Right? No one roots for Goliath. Now, what I want is for people to look hard at Canelo here. Let's talk about things that might not be openly admitted. But just understand, we live in a world where, you know, a Gorbachev ultimately gets forced out. Where... what Canelo's going through here. Puts up the first triple-double in all-star game history in the NBA. And at the time, we took him for granted so much that they gave the game MVP to someone else. Right now, during the fight, I had X open, the former Twitter. And I was looking at the comments, and the people on X tend to skew young, right? This is where Ryan Garcia is king, on X. And let's just say Canelo, really a great fighter, um, one of the dominant athletes of our time, certainly in boxing, right? This is a guy who you're going to look back 20 years from now, and you're going to remember his run, Right? He's going to be a benchmark for certain things. Right? Four champs at 168. He unifies the title by taking them out one by one. Right? That's the level of talent we're talking about. But on X, you had a lot of people. It's an open secret. Rooting for Jaime Munguia. A lot of younger people. Right? If I had to put ages on the people posting on X, you know, looking at the profiles. They were younger people. And they're suffering from Canelo fatigue. The guy has been so dominant for so long, right? Fighting big names. Let me name his last five opponents because we're hearing he hasn't stopped any of them. Right? Golovkin, Hall of Famer, on the Mount Rushmore of middleweight champs. Just look at his record as middleweight champ. A fighter who's still unbeaten. Light heavyweight Dimitri Bevel. Right? A fighter who Canelo fought when the guy was undisputed. Jamel Charlo. Right? John Ryder, more than 30 wins. Jaime Munguia, a guy who going into the fight had 40-odd wins and no losses. Right now, those are the guys Canelo is fighting. I'm just telling you, he's at the stage of his career where people are now rooting against him. Right? He's viewed as a Goliath. He's no longer viewed as the future. 
he's viewed as the incumbent. And you have a whole group of people who say, okay, we know about Canelo. He's had his day. You know, we want someone new. We want, you know, someone who can beat him and take this in the direction of a new generation. So, someone has to say it. You know, I'm shocked. I mean, I'm, I'm truly astonished at just what Canelo has had to put up with in the lead up to this fight and while the fight's happening. Right? In the lead up of the fight, and understand, I'm a big Oscar De La Hoya fan. He was a tremendous fighter. Tremendous. Right? But I was a little bit surprised that any promoter, whatever the history is, and Lord knows, you know, in the business world, certainly in the boxing world, they're going to be split ups, they're going to be disagreements between fighters and former promoters. Folks, that's folded into the history of the sport. Right? But I was a little bit shocked that going into this fight, De La Hoya took some of the shots at Canelo that he did. You know, keep in mind, Canelo's giving his fighter an opportunity. You know, keep in mind, Jaime Munguia is made, in fact, a lot of money on this fight because he's fighting Canelo. And I was, I was a little bit surprised that you would Look at a guy who's really one of the standard bearers for the sport. And Canelo, you know, would have to actually address some of what Oscar's saying. I thought, man, this is a bit ridiculous. So then we, um, we get to the fight. Let me quote Michael Jordan, right? Jordan is one of those rare elite athletes who in his heyday, told you what the life was like, told you his philosophy, right? He was in Canelo's position, right? A great guy who we got so tired of that we started giving MVPs to Carl Malone, right? Jordan used to say, you know, offense comes and goes, but you should be able to play great defense every night. That was a Jordan belief. Understand, Jordan averages 30 points a game for his career. It's not like the brother didn't have elite offense. But for him, offense came and went. But there was no excuse for not having great defense. Right now, the fight Canelo just threw down showed you that Canelo is Canelo. Maybe I should say Canelo is still Canelo. What I want people to realize is that uh, Jaime Munguia, who I have a lot of respect for, right? Munguia came out, he tried to make a big fight of it. This was his shot, he tried to take it. He blew up my under 10 and a half round prop, right? He, you know, there were no knockouts in the fight, right? He showed a lot of heart. There's no question about that. On my scorecard, he comes out and he wins the first two rounds. I'm telling you on X, folks were beside themselves. They thought that this time was going to be different. They thought that Munguia was going to come in the front door on Canelo. Some people online in the thread I was in thought they were about to see a stoppage. Right? That this was the new against the incumbent and the incumbent was going to be in trouble. We get to the third round and you start to notice the Jordan rule. Right? Canelo has great defense. Canelo is defensively blessed. Right? First two rounds, Jaime Munguia comes out. He's jabbing his way in. 
we were all excited, right? He's coming in. He's throwing volume at Canelo. He's not hiding. He's not intimidated. He's coming in the pocket and he's throwing a jab. By the third round, you notice that Canelo is not concerned with the jab. Right? The jab is not, and I'm going to pub some of the next generation here. The jab is not a power jab. This is not a Hamza Shiraz, Virgil Ortiz jab, where the guy doesn't have to throw anything else. Where the guy's coming in behind a jab, and that jab is finding a home, and an opponent is getting marked up. Right? That's not Jaime Munguia's jab. Let's make another point here, too. Freddie Roach, this is his second fight with Jaime Munguia. Roach has made adjustments. Right? But you and I know it takes a little bit for a trainer and a fighter to click. Also, the trainer really has to deal with the fighter's proclivities. Now understand, Manny Pacquiao, likely Freddie Roach's most prized fighter, would move around on the outside. You didn't know when Manny Pacquiao was going to jump in the pocket. Right? Pacquiao would move around. You might remember Pacquiao moving his head and stuff like that. Pacquiao had a herky-jerky thing going on. You didn't know whether he was coming or going. If you were the opponent, given Pacquiao's hand speed and suddenness, and that's what's missing from this fight, the suddenness, fighters against him had to be really on their back foot, right? Had to anticipate Pacquiao's next strike in the pocket. Then, of course, Pacquiao had ring coverage. So Pacquiao could throw that straight left. Pacquiao's a southpaw from what looked like the outer limits of the pocket. And Pacquiao, who was not the tallest man, somehow was able to travel a lot of ground with that straight left. And he would hit opponents clean because he was so sudden. Let me name a variation of that. Another Freddie Roach fighter. Right? Miguel Cotto. Cotto comes to Roach later in his career. Cotto at that point is already a star. Cotto has a great left hook. I want people to look at the, let's revisit it. I understand the public disagrees with me here, but revisit Cotto against Canelo. Right? That fight was better than advertised. I believe what hurt that fight significantly was the fact that they had some ridiculous PC uh, let's give you the scoring during the fight nonsense going on and uh, that undercut that fight a little bit. Right? But just to understand, um, Kodo is outside dancing around the pocket because we know you can't be in the pocket against a technician like Canelo. That's who Canelo is. Right? Jaime Munguia is a fighter. You wouldn't want to go up against Jaime Munguia in a bar fight. He's a fighter. He's full of energy. He's ready to try to walk you down. He's going to throw a lot of punches. There's an emotional content to what he's doing. Right? By contrast, Canelo really is like a hitman, right? Canelo is dispassionate at this stage of his career. He's mathematical. He sees you doing things. He knows he can exploit them, right? For all the knockouts, for all the power Canelo has, and he's one of the hardest punchers pound for pound in the entire sport today. Right? Understand Canelo, like Crawford, is crunching numbers in his head. Right? He's thinking about how to do things. He wants you 
This is the counterpuncher's mindset. He wants you to open up against him, to come after him throwing a lot of punches. Because number one, he's defensively blessed. He's a shorter guy. His chin is tucked. Look at any round of this fight. Look at Canelo's chin. His chin's tucked, right? You're throwing a jab. Canelo, in this fight, doesn't even have to move out of the way of it. He's catching the shots on his forearms. That's how advanced the guy is. Right? And Canelo is seeing openings, and Canelo is making the most of them. So let's move to the fourth round of this fight. Right, Jaime Munguia is predictably in the pocket. He's the taller guy. Now, longtime viewers here know I like tall guys who can lean backwards. Right, Vitaly Klitschko. Lennox Lewis. Right, I like the tall guy who can keep you outside, has the tools to keep you outside, and if you try to counterpunch them, they can lean back, have the punch stop here. Jack Johnson researched the concept of the pull counter. Right, A tall guy who can lean backwards is a problem for shorter fighters. Right, Understand, too, Boxing's a game of inches. In a famous fight, Ali, taller guy who could lean backwards, lean backwards against Joe Fraser. Fraser, of course, a shorter guy with one of boxing's best left hooks, had ring coverage. As Ali leaned backwards, Fraser takes the extra step forward, lands the left hook, drops Ali. Well, we don't have to worry about leaning backwards with Jaime Munguia, do we? Munguia against one of boxing's blessed punchers. Munguia's a blessed puncher himself on some shots, not his jab. Munguia's leaning over the pocket. So in the fourth round, I want people to look at the knockdown here. And I want people to see how clean the shots were landed by Canelo. Right now, Canelo today still has one of the absolute best left hooks in boxing. Right? It's a Joe Fraser type left hook. Canelo can move across the ring with it. It has ring coverage. Now, given that Canelo has one of boxing's best left hooks. And given that Canelo, for all intents and purposes, stops Billy Joe Saunders on a right uppercut as Saunders tries to come in the pocket. In other words, we already know from past Canelo wins, you don't want to be leaning over the pocket against him. You already know that. You already know you have to look out for a Canelo uppercut. So Jaime Munguia is not defensively blessed. Understand, even with Freddie Roach in their second fight, Jaime Munguia is coming forward on a guy he had to have outweighed by at least 15 pounds. Look, I'm a David Benavides fight, uh, fan, right? Benavides to me is a savant. But understand, when Canelo talks about Benavides bringing 20 extra pounds to the table and people say, oh, gee, Canelo's afraid to fight Benavides at a time when Benavides' next fight isn't even at 168, it's 175. Then you look at Jaime Munguia right before this fight starts versus Canelo. In the comment section of this video, tell me how many pounds you feel Jaime Munguia outweighed Canelo by when this fight started. It had to be at least 15 pounds. Right? You can't tell me these two guys, these two guys are in the same weight class. Understand, too. 
understand too, the argument that Canelo is afraid to fight big guys ignores the fact that Canelo himself was the champ at 175, right? He beat Kovalev. That's not the only time he fought at 175. Right? Bevel was the champ at 175. So, just to understand, Canelo's in here against a bigger man. So in the fourth round, we see the skill gap. Canelo in the third round has disengaged Jaime Munguia's jab. Look at Canelo's face after the fight. The guy's butted heads a few times, so his forehead's red. Canelo doesn't have a swollen eye. He doesn't have a swollen lip. For all the jabs Jaime Munguia threw, Canelo looks like he just got out the shower. Right, Canelo, third round, he's not worried about Munguia's jab. Fourth round, what's the combination that puts down Jaime Munguia? Folks, look at the film. The highlights are all over YouTube. Canelo lands a left hook first. Folks, it lands cleanly. There is nothing between Munguia and Canelo's left hook. Munguia, who's not defensively blessed, doesn't have any defense for the left hook. But that's not Canelo's real punch. The punch that puts Jaime Munguia down is the uppercut, the right uppercut. Folks, that lands flush. Right, that hits Munguia right in the face. And Munguia goes down. What that should tell you is that by the fourth round, Canelo is picking his shots. This is what technicians do. You're hyper-aggressive. The guy reads you like a book. The guy then starts disengaging parts of your offense. That Munguia jab, again, it's not a Virgil Ortiz jab. It's not a Shiraz jab, right? Canelo has switched it off by the end of the third round. In the fourth round, Canelo starts landing big punches. Understand the story of the rest of the fight. We notice headshots a lot more. But Canelo lands several home run left hooks to Munguia's body to the point where on the telecast, they start talking about how Munguia is starting to have a hand down. To protect his body. Munguia is a right-handed fighter. Folks, the hand Munguia has down trying to protect his body is his right hand. Right? I mean, just, just understand, Canelo is taking away parts of Munguia's arsenal with excellent body shots and timing. I thought it was a fascinating fight. I thought that Munguia was in over his head. Munguia is a guy who is hyper aggressive, even with Freddie Roach, right? He's emotional. He's riding emotional waves. He's coming forward. He wants to mix it up. Understand, it's literally at that point where technicians take over. They understand this guy wants to be a lead puncher. This guy thinks he can hit me with a jab and then come in with hooks. That's the other problem Munguia has. He's a hooker, right? His straightest punch was his jab. Now contrast that with Manny Pacquiao, who throws a straight left. In other words, spacing-wise, there's certain times where Canelo, in fact, let's say all 12 rounds, Canelo understood the only straight punch this guy can hit me with is the jab. He has to be close to me to land his power shot. Now, that's different than the situation with a Pacquiao, where you see Pacquiao from outside, and he's like Steph Curry shooting threes. Right here, I know the fighter has to be closer to me. You notice Canelo is laying in the weeds. He just takes a step back a little bit. Right? As Munguia is coming forward, he blocks shots with his forearm so he's close to Munguia. 
Then he waits for countering opportunities, and he's landing more shots than Munguia. So let me uh, just say, in the third round of this fight, it's this early, on the telecast, Sergio Mora makes a statement that sums up the fight. This was before the knockdown. He says, there is no way this doesn't turn into a firefight. Jaime Munguia is not a boxer. That's not his temperament. Well, folks, understand, being a boxer is Canelo's temperament. He loses the first two rounds. There's no panic. He's seeing what the younger fighter has. Canelo has to realize what Wilt Chamberlain realized. What Jerry Seinfeld, another philosopher guy who talks about life, realized. Right? Seinfeld talks about how there comes a time during a monologue where you're telling extra jokes. You're giving the crowd more value for their money. And the crowd starts to lose interest. They don't see it as more value for their money. Their attention span, you've already exhausted it. So you have to get off the stage. That's the explanation Seinfeld gave for pulling the plug on his very successful TV show. Right? He felt he had reached a point where the people had started to lose interest. Right? Here is Canelo. He had to realize that many of the younger people in the crowd, we'll call them the Ryan Garcia generation, are restless for something new. The fact that Canelo is undisputed at 33, well, he's in his 30s. He's an old man. Right? The fact that he's undisputed, the fact that he's fighting other undisputed fighters, the fact that he's in this fight, fighting a guy who outweighs him by at least 15 pounds, is overlooked. All we're hearing about is the fact that he hasn't KO'd anyone in his last fights. Even though, of course, just like he dropped Ryder, just like he dropped Charlo, in this fight he drops Munguia in the fourth round. Folks, that's early. That's the first third of the fight. He drops Munguia on clean shots. Right? Understand the way the rest of the fight goes. It's Canelo picking and choosing. It's Canelo landing big-time body shots. Now, obviously, I had a KO prop. I was hoping Canelo would throw the left hook up top, land it on Jaime Munguia's head, and end the night. The reality is he did a couple of times. Munguia took the punch. Right? All praise to Munguia. He was in a battle. He took the punch. But understand, he could not take the skill level. Canelo was clearly the better fighter here. Canelo, of course, after losing the first two rounds, takes over the fight. Where, by the time the tenth round came about, you thought, wow, Munguia needs a knockout to win the fight. So, what I want people to do, what I want Canelo to do, is to realize that he's in the part of his career that Jordan got to, that Tiger Woods got to, where people are now starting to root against him. Right? This is very different than, let's say, the Floyd Mayweather career path, where Floyd was the guy you love to hate, right? Floyd was never the house fighter. People thought he was, you know, some young boisterous guy who needed to be shown that he wasn't all that, even though Floyd was all that, right? Canelo rode a different wave. He rode the wave Jordan rose, where we, we look at him and we said, oh man, this is new, he's great. He was our hero. Right, folks? Now, he could throw down a triple-double. You're not going to give him the All-Star Game MVP. 
right? He could fight future Hall of Famers. I think Golovkin's a future Hall of Famer. I think Bevel's a future Hall of Famer. I think Charlo's a future Hall of Famer. He can fight future Hall of Famers in three of his last five fights, right? Maybe Munguia gets there. We'll find out. Munguia's still in his 20s. And the talk's going to be on who he's not fighting. Right? Okay, he's not fighting Benavides. Right? That's the talk. Right? He's supposed to be ducking Benavides, who you and I know, and I don't care what people in camps have to say. There is no way Benavides ever makes 168 again for his career. Canelo would have to go up to 175 to fight him. Right? So if I'm Saul Alvarez, I have to ask a tough question here. Right? It's the question Jerry Seinfeld had to ask. Do I stay on the stage? Right? At this point, I'm not sure if Canelo can make the people happy. He's viewed as the incumbent. He's no longer viewed as the upstart. Right? I, I can see a situation where some charismatic younger guy fights him. It's a close fight. And then they give it to the young guy. Just like they ripped off Jordan for that MVP award. They give it to the young guy just because the young guy came close enough. Right? Canelo is Goliath. No one roots for Goliath. Canelo has somehow, in a career of excellence, reached a point where even former promoters are taking cheap shots on him when he's giving their fighters the opportunity to fight him. Right? So, the fight I want to see, and hey, I have an agenda, right? At this stage, the fight I want to see is Crawford against Canelo. Right? Jaime Munguia, put differently, had no plan B, right? He goes down in the fourth round. Does Munguia have the back foot to change the dynamic? Is Munguia, in arguably this fighter's best moment, a Thomas Hearns, who gets dropped by Ray Leonard, gets off the canvas in the middle of a fight, changes his fight style, and then is on the verge of outpointing Ray Leonard when he gets caught in the 14th round, right? Is Munguia that guy? He's not. We heard a lot about superstar trainer Freddie Roach. Freddie Roach is a superstar trainer. But the bottom line is, Munguia, you understood, he is leaning over the pocket when he gets dropped. What's Munguia doing the rest of the fight, folks? He's leaning over the pocket, right? Munguia actually is light on his feet. But he can't marry that with throwing punches. In other words, you see him moving side to side, but he's not doing anything. And, of course, he's fighting a vet who watches him move side to side. Canelo's view on life is, let the game come to you. So Munguia could move side to side. Canelo's just going to wait until Munguia gets back to being Jaime Munguia. To use a word that Sergio Mora used, that's his temperament. Munguia's going to come in the pocket. Munguia's going to throw a lot of punches. Canelo, again, for all the power, is an expert counterpuncher. This is a marksman. So as Munguia comes in, throwing punches, thinking he's about to rough up an old guy, boxing's a young man's game, 33 is old in boxing, at 168, that young guy is using... Munguia's aggression against him to land home run level left hooks to the body. And Munguia, of course, let's face it, could have been hit by a train. He's never going to change his facial expression. Right? That's what, you know, bravado, young bravado does for you. So Munguia is out of ideas after hitting the canvas in the fourth round. By contrast, a Crawford there'd be intrigue, right? Is Crawford coming out lefty or righty, right? What does Crawford do 
after Canelo makes his adjustments. I mean, folks, it's clear in the third round Canelo has figured out how to dodge Munguia's jab. Right, that's clear. Fourth round, he drops him. <laughs> right? Then he's, then he's landing left hooks to the body. It's not like Munguia moves away from Canelo's left hook and changes the angles. That's just not who Munguia is. You and I know that's who Crawford is at times. Right? So let's just say I like boxing brilliance. Canelo is still a brilliant fighter. Right? Even as young people on X are hoping that someone from their generation can beat him. Right? At this point, I just want to see boxing brilliance. Right? Benavides is a brilliant fighter. Benavides is in a different weight class. Let's move off of Benavides. And let's focus on guys who can fight Canelo at 168. Right? Let me also say, too, Canelo has to realize that there is a new guard who would give him problems. Right? I do believe that Hamza Shiraz beats Canelo. Right? Shiraz is part of that five-on-five five show that's coming up. What I want is for people to look at that show and judge him for yourself. Let me also say, too, I know there's some, we'll call them um, man-about-town type guys in boxing who aren't even interested in titles, right? They have a skill set. Boxing for them is a craft, but it's really more of a payday than anything else. As I was watching this fight, I was thinking, man, it would be great if Chris Eubank, Chris, get off the sofa, get back in the ring, please, if Chris Eubank were in here. Because then we would get some cat and mouse. In other words, if Eubanks on his front foot, then he gets hit with a few of these Canelo left hooks, and he says, oh, you know, this isn't the best idea I've had in my career. You and I know Chris would have a plan B. Chris would have a plan C. Chris would have a plan D. Right? You know, Chris gets knocked down by Liam Smith, uh, folks, that's the only time he's been knocked down in his career. This is a guy who fought people like George Groves, puncher types. Right? And so with Canelo at this stage, let's just say you either have to have great skills. The thing with Shiraz is he has height with a power jab. So Canelo wouldn't be able to lay in the weeds to throw counters because Shiraz would be too far away to get hit with the counter. Right, Shiraz also, he leans forward a bit too much, but he can lean backwards. Right? You know, let's just say I want to see Canelo against not emotional guys who the announcer for the fight is telling you is not a boxer. I want to see Canelo in against guys who themselves are technicians. Right? Canelo still is at an elite level. I wouldn't blame him if he walks away from the sport. If he says, look, um, you know, I've taken this a great distance. Uh, now it's time for me to enjoy the rest of my life. Right? Because he's past his peak popularity. Can we say that publicly? Right? For many people here, he was just a litmus test for Jaime Munguia. I encourage people to look up the comments on this fight as it happened on X today. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours. I hope you leave them in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.